metabolism here that we're going to be discussing is about triglyceride metabolism. And then we'll just talk a little bit about proteins and call it a day on metabolism and go into our very first system, which is the nervous system, and we'll apply some of these concepts that we learned. Um, all right, so summary for this particular uh, part of the lecture, we're going to talk about how fat can be stored in lipogenesis, how it can be broken down in the process of lipolysis, and how ATP energy can be produced from fat. We're going to talk also something that's kind of cool now that we've learned about electron transport. Um, there's a particular type of molecule called brown fat that you don't find uh, just anywhere. We'll be talking about that. Um, we'll talk about ketone bodies a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about proteins not too much. Really, there's not too much about protein metabolism in this. Um, it's mainly glucose metabolism is the, the bulkiest information. Then we have a little bit about triglyceride metabolism, and then less about protein metabolism. So fats <coughs> can be hydrolyzed. Hydrolysis reactions, what do they do? Break stuff down, build stuff up. We use this word hydrolyze now a lot. So what's it mean? Breaks down stuff, right. So triglycerides can be hydrolyzed, hydro, I was gonna say hydrolysis, hyd hydrolyzed to glycerol and the three fatty acids. So you remember triglycerides had glycerol molecule attached to three fatty acids. Now these can be modified to run through uh, the Krebs cycle, although the amount of energy produced is going to be different. Um, proteins can be broken down to amino acids, um, and we can take away the amino group and run it through the Krebs cycle as well. We can actually interconvert a lot of these pathways, proteins, lipids, and uh, sugars, and we can, we can actually create these molecules from other molecules, or we can create energy from them. It depends. I don't know if you remember, oh, some time ago, at the beginning of the semester, I think I told you... Uh, cholesterol is one of those molecules that you never really have to consume in your diet. You know, you use it in your plasma membranes of your cells, it's true, it's, an, it's important, it's in steroid hormones and all of that, but your body can make it. You don't have to actually eat it, it's not, not necessary. So again, your body can make what it needs uh, for the most part. So. When we have more energy taken in than is consumed, ATP synthesis is inhibited. So if you're sitting on the couch watching, you know, football, and you're eating like a big bowl of macaroni and cheese and maybe some potato chips and pizza, like I'm thinking of all my favorite things, and then, um, you know, you're not moving much, just sort of sitting there. Maybe once in a while you'll shake your hand at the TV or swear or something. Um, but for the most part, you're not using much energy, right? You're taking in a whole lot more than what you're needed. Then glucose is going to be converted into glycogen in the skeletal muscle in the liver and also to triglycerides or fats. So this diagram shows us pretty much the glycolysis pathway that we've seen before, um, but there are some modifications to it. So here we've got glucose, we bring it into our bodies, of course we go through the process where ultimately we can form pyruvic acid. But if we have more glucose than what we can use to make energy or store as glycogen, then when we get to the point where we have 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde, that will be converted to glycerol. And then acetyl coenzyme A, how many carbons was acetic acid, do you remember? It's the go-to answer. Hmm? It must be two. It's two. Oh. Right, you remember you, pyruvic acid's three carbons, and we said whenever oxygen's available, you produce acetic acid. Remember, it's oxidized, it, it loses a carbon to become acetic acid. So acetic acid has two carbons, and those two carbon molecules can be strung together to form fatty acid chains. And then we'll get three fatty acid chains, attach it to a glycerol molecule, and generate a triglyceride. And of 
course, this process occurs in what kind of cell? That you had a test on, you looked at it under the microscope. Where, where would you make triglycerides and store them? Adipose. Adipose, adipose, adipocytes, right? Fat cells. That's where this process will take place. Now, this process illustrated by the blue lines where we're making glycerol and three fatty acids to generate triglycerides, is this illustrating lipogenesis or lipolysis? This blue arrow that you see here, um, where ultimately we're generating glycerol and three fatty acids to form a triglyceride, is this illustrating lipolysis or lipogenesis? Lipogenesis. Lipogenesis. Very good job. Good. Okay. And then, of course, the opposite will be true. If we take the fatty acid chains and we break everything down, that's lipolysis, right? So again, I'm repeating a lot of stuff because I just, I want you to get familiar with the vocabulary and certain things I'm trying to repeat again so that you can um, try to, again, feel comfortable with, with how we're talking. So anyway, um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much what we're seeing here is the process of lipogenesis. And this occurs in adipocytes. So acetylcholenzyme A is quite a, a hub as a molecule. So again, remember where we produced acetylcholenzyme A. Acetylcholenzyme A was produced, went through glycolysis, we made pyruvic acid, three carbon molecule, enough oxygen was present, so it was oxidized to acetic acid, which combines with coenzyme A, right, to acetylcholenzyme A. So acetylcholenzyme A, again, it, it's a hub. It's like a hub of a substrate. It can become different things. So we've talked already today about how acetylcholenzyme A can be converted to citric acid cycle in, or the Krebs, in, during the Krebs cycle, and then ultimately be utilized to make energy, ATP, through the Krebs cycle and chemical osmosis and all of that. Okay, but just in the previous slide, now we just talked about how acetylcholenzyme A can also be used to make a, a long chain uh, fatty acid chain of carbons and hydrogens, right, hydrocarbon chain. Now, if we have two fatty acid chains and we attach it to a phosphate group, then we can produce phospholipids, which we use in plasma membranes, membranes of organelles, and so forth. Or, like we just talked about on the previous slide, we can take three fatty acid chains, add them to a glycerol, and make triglycerides in our adipocytes. So ultimately, again, um, you know, fatty acids can be used to make different types of molecules. But the other thing that acetylcholenzyme A can be used to make is cholesterol, which as we saw in uh, chapter two, I think, uh, cholesterol is the backbone for steroid hormone synthesis, including testosterone, estrogen, um, cortisol. Those are the ones you mentioned. And then also cholesterol is important um, in bile acids, which are made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and helps to emulsify fats in the small intestine so that we can absorb it into those lacteals, those little lymphatic capillaries in the digestive tract. And then we have acetylcholenzyme A, which can be used to make ketone bodies as well. So directly, acetylcholenzyme A can make citric acid, cholesterol, fatty acids, or ketone bodies. And then those can be used to do other things. So it's a very important substrate, acetylcholenzyme A. So as I said, acetylcholenzyme A's can be linked together to form fatty acids. Because acetic acid has two carbons, you get two carbons at a time. Uh, this occurs, uh, this process of lipogenesis occurs in adipose uh, tissue and liver tissues. And I mentioned to you guys before, and here we're going to see exactly what I'm talking about, that triglycerides are the major, the most major energy storage form that we have in our bodies. Do you remember why? Do you remember why it has more energy in a triglyceride molecule than in a glucose molecule? Because it's 
Molecules come together, remember, to form um, to form the cells, right? And all of it. So, not, no. The energy in the molecule is stored in its bonds. Okay, so triglycerides, if you remember the structure, those three fatty acid chains have tons of bonds compared to glucose. Glucose doesn't have quite as many. Triglycerides are, are huge. They're compact little molecules, but they can generate nine kilocalories per gram, per, per gram of weight of triglycerides, whereas carbohydrates and proteins, only about four kilocalories per gram. And triglycerides are the primary energy source for most of the organs in our body, except, do you remember which organ I told you? Oh, you okay there? <laughs> um, which, which organ did I tell you um, that preferred glucose, do you remember? The brain, that's exactly right, good. So, we're gonna see why triglycerides give you so much ATP in just a minute. Um, we're gonna talk about the process of glycolysis. This is where we break down uh, fatty acids, uh, triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol, and um, this is done by an enzyme called lipase, uh, and in fact, uh, if you think of it, do you remember in the small intestine that the pancreatic juice, the juice that the pancreas secretes, had three enzymes in it? Remember? Pancreatic trypsin, pancreatic amylase, and pancreatic lipase. That's where this comes from. So this process a lot of times is going to occur you know, somewhere uh, in, in the digestive uh, tract. So acetylcholenzyme A's from the free fatty acids serve as a major energy source. How we break down fats, this process of lipolysis, um, specifically occurs through a process called beta oxidation. So let me explain the term beta oxidation. So you remember how I told you that carbons, we can, we can number the carbons in a molecule? Remember how I told you that? You can also put a Greek letter with them as well. So you can have the alpha carbon, you can have the beta carbon, so it's like A and B. Okay, oxidation, we know, means that something is losing electrons or you know atoms or something like that. So essentially what this process does is we clip off acetyl coenzyme A's two carbons at a time at the beta carbon. They're losing those carbons. This, ch this fatty acid chain is losing carbon. So that's why it's called beta oxidation. You don't have to know all the particulars of this. Um, what we have here, we have um, essentially the, the process of beta oxidation, which is illustrated here. The key thing to know about it is how many ATPs are generated. So we have one and a half here, two and a half here for a total of four ATP. Um, beta oxidation yields four ATP molecules. So this process, beta oxidation yields four ATP. And then, unfortunately, you can't see the bottom of this diagram. But basically what you've got here, this is a fatty acid chain. You can see that we're clipping off, we're clipping off the carbon at the beta carbon. That's where, where the bond is being broken and we're producing acetic acid to produce acetyl coenzyme A. Now when you go through the Krebs cycle this way, you're generating 10 ATP. So like I said, the process is a little different. You don't yield the same amount as you did with glucose. But you think about it, and so if you have just two carbons coming off of a triglyceride, you're generating how many ATP? 10 from Krebs, four from beta oxidation, 14. So if I did some calculation here, don't worry, it's just basically a little addition and some multiplication. Um, okay, if we had a triglyceride chain that had 
I don't know, 10 carbons. Okay. So this is a saturated fatty acid chain. No double bonds. Keep in mind in a triglyceride molecule, you're going to have three of these, but I'll just draw out the one. Okay, so in this process, we're going to clip off two carbons at a time. So for this first tri, this first uh, fatty acid chain, how many acetyl coenzyme A's can I get? If I have ten carbons here, five. Right. Flip it off at the, this is the alpha, this is the beta carbon, so clip it. This is alpha, that's beta carbon, clip it, clip it, clip it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so one fatty acid chain, we have five acetyl coenzyme A molecules that we can produce. So how many, right, just right there, how many ATP do we get from one acetyl coenzyme A? Did we say? Well, we get four from beta oxidation and we get 10 from Krebs cycle for a total of 14. 14, right? So, okay, so we can get five acetyl coenzyme A's from one fatty acid chain. We can make 14 ATP. from each one. So let's multiply 14 times 5 and we get 70. Right? But then we have three fatty acid chains. Each we'll assume is the same length. Each one can generate 5-acetyl coenzyme A's and ultimately generate 70 ATPs. So let's multiply by 3 and we get 210 <coughs> ATP for one that for one triglyceride. <coughs> that makes sense? You see that? It's a lot of energy. When you compare it, that's one triglyceride, and I'm assuming sometimes the fatty acid chains are even longer. But, you know, glucose molecules generate what? Under normal physiological circumstances, 30. But as we calculated and learned here, which will be on the test, is, you know, 36 to 38. Still, I mean, 210 compared to that, that's the reason why triglycerides are such a huge storage form. There's a lot more bonds to break. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, so let's see now. Um, oh, good, brown fat. This is interesting. So we do, you know, some people maintain brown fat, uh, but not so much. Usually when you're first born, you're gonna have a large amount of brown fat tissue. What makes brown fat different than the regular fat that we think of or that we looked at under the slide is basically in the electron transport chain and the crystae of the mitochondria. What happens here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back some slides so I can illustrate it, you can look at it and see. With brown fat tissue, um, you see here like the way that this is, this is a real airtight, an airtight um, setup. You have the electron transport chain, the only way the hydrogen can come back is through the ATP synthase. But in brown fat cells, there are leaky areas in the membrane, this cristae. And so therefore, some of the hydrogen is leaking. So it's harder to maintain, it's harder to maintain that high concentration of hydrogen here. And the electron transport chain has to work harder. So therefore, you've got more oxidation reduction reactions and you're getting more heat generated. So brown fat is actually thermogenic. It generates heat 
And of course, it makes sense that babies have it um, whenever they're first born. And then you tend to lose it as you get older. You don't have as much brown fat as you do when you're born because of that. Does that make sense? So the holes kind of make it degenerate itself. Well, it makes it so that... The hydrogen leaks and it can't maintain itself. Yeah, you, yeah. The so you, you want to have the high hydrogen concentration here because you're generating the ATP when it rushes back. But if this membrane is leaky and some of that hydrogen is coming back, you have to work harder to pump more hydrogen there. It's sort of like, I don't know, like just sort of trying to keep up. Yeah, like burns which, itself out. Yeah. But again, every time we have reactions taking place, you generate heat. And so that's where that comes into play. So yeah, it's thermogenic. It's a, it's a good, it's nice to have, especially when it's cold. All right, so lastly about the triglycerides. Triglycerides, they are continually broken down and resynthesized which ensures that blood always contains fatty acids for aerobic respiration. The fact that we can break down triglycerides into acetyl coenzyme A molecules, which we know are necessary to go through cellular respiration, ensures that we have that capability. If triglycerides, if free fatty acids are floating around in the bloodstream, your, your organs uh, can always use that as long as you have an adequate amount of oxygen available. During fasting, or if somebody has diabetes, or if you're on the keto diet, um, lots of fats broken down, which causes a lot of high levels of ketone bodies, which gives the nail polish the acetone, gives the breath that fruity acetone smell, like nail polish remover that you were mentioning earlier, I think. Yeah. Okay, lastly, very short little couple of things about proteins. That, first of all, is there anything about fats that you want to ask? All right. Um, so nitrogen, which we know is a part of proteins because it's found in amino acids, which of course are the building blocks of proteins. Nitrogen is, um, that it can make the blood more acidic Excess nitrogen is excreted as urea. Um, and this can be excreted sometimes through your sweat or through urine, uh, which is pretty common. Excess amino acids can be converted, surprisingly, to carbohydrates and fats. There's, again, these pathways are very interchangeable, as we saw with gluconeogenesis, with the lactic acid converting it back to glucose and so forth. In terms of amino acids, we know that there are 20. 12 of them we can produce in our bodies, but eight are essential, which means that they have to come from the diet. The essential amino acids are over here. Um, lysine, tryptophan, which is in the turkey, phenylalanine, uh, provided that you can break that down, right? Some people cannot break down your, remember when we talked about metabolic pathways in chapter four, we're talking about PKU. I have such a hard time pronouncing it. Phenylketonuria. I have to say it slowly because it's hard for me. PKU. That's where people can't metabolize phenylalanine, so they can't ingest it. So children, if they do, they can end up with um, with uh, issues uh, mentally um, because of that. Uh, methionine, which we know we talked about. For the last test, methionine is usually the first amino acid in a protein. And histidine, which is one uh, that children need, but as we grow, we actually can, we don't, we, we don't need to ingest that, we can make it. And these are the ones that we can make, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, proline, glycine, serine, alanine, cysteine, um, all, all of those. So you don't have to memorize that list. Just know that some of them have to come from the diet and some of them can be produced by the body. And if you have to ingest it, they're essential amino acids. And we already talked about gluconeogenesis where <coughs> amino acids or other non-carbohydrates are converted back to glucose. And again, through the Cori cycle, we saw that today. 
between the skeletal muscle and the liver and conversion of lactic acid back to glucose again. And last slide for this lecture um, is, uh, what I should say for this chapter, is um, this one, which basically it's a nice little table and it shows us energy preferences um, of the different organs. And as I said, the brain prefers glucose over fatty acids and ketone body. But pretty much everybody else, skeletal muscle, the liver, and the heart, all seem to prefer fatty acids more than <coughs> any other energy source that we, we, can, we can use. Um, so fatty acids are a big deal. And again, most of the time, we have a pretty good supply of fatty acids sort of floating around in our bloodstream just for the purpose of being able to um, have it there for when we need to make it. Do you have any questions? <coughs> All right, so that's it for metabolism. And now we can talk a little bit about the nervous system. The first part is pretty much anatomy. There's not a whole lot of uh, the physiology part in this. I am glad I posted this. I just I just just posted it this morning. I didn't know if we were going to get to it, but I thought well, maybe I'm going to maybe I'll go ahead and just do it just in case. This way we don't waste time. I tell you what, I, I will let you go today. How about at like I don't know. Now, I know you're going to say this. Maybe like, how about a, a quarter after? Like, maybe 10 minutes early. Yeah, well, it's lucky. Lucky seven. Well, I'd like to introduce it because I'd really like to just sort of hop into it on Tuesday. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I mean, but like I said, we, we just, we don't get, get as much time taking having that one day off of the 4th of July. I, I would have liked to have had a makeup class, but the problem is, I don't know that I could get anybody, like, all the schedules to coincide. I tried to do that one time when we didn't have lab because of the weather. One year, it was so bad. And I, I only had maybe nine people in that class, but we could not get it to coordinate at all with the schedules. I'm like, you work every day, but you're not here, so that would be impossible. Yeah. I suppose what I could do, although I don't know how successful this was, I did actually post a um, PowerPoint with a voice, you know, lecture, and I posted that. I've done that before, but people don't watch it then. <laughs> yeah, that 4th of July is not so good. It's good, but it's not good. All right, anyway, so let's see here. So neurons and supporting cells. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, first of all, the nervous system itself is like the final frontier. Not really. I mean, it's. they say that there's just so much we don't know about the nervous system. Even still, there's so many mysteries of the nervous system that it really is a highly researched um, system. And, Science. I mean, obviously, other organs, we, I mean, we don't know how all of them work in, inside and out, right? I mean, the heart, we're pretty good on. <laughs> but the brain, there's so much. There's, you know, the essence of a person, uh, personality, character, lots of, of other things are very connected um, with the brain. And so there's so much involved. I mean, some people, have really special abilities that their brain gives them uh, that we don't fully understand. We might say, oh, okay, well, anatomically, bless you, this area is larger than this area, but we still can't, you know, understand. like you were talking about Einstein's brain and how it was different. He told me what I remember. But like, you know, some people, they have these abilities where they can just see things you know, some people have photographic memories. Some people can see things, and then they can write it down on paper and mathematically prove it, like Einstein did. Or some people 
have the ability to relive a certain event, you know, completely in every detail because the subconscious is so, so prevalent that they can, you know, and sometimes that's hard. Have you heard of those kinds of people where they just, you know, it's, it's hard because sometimes you really live a painful moment in your life and it's like it just happened. So the brain is very interesting. There's, there's a lot involved with it. But this first part we're going to be looking at is just sort of a, an anatomical uh, look at it. And so I don't think it'll take us too long to go through it. The second part is about the physiology of how things work in the neuron. Um, and then the last part is uh, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters, which is how the, the neurons will communicate with each other and the different types of effects that they can produce. So to begin, the nervous system is divided into two parts, the central nervous system, including the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which includes all 12 pairs of cranial nerves and all the spinal nerves that are um, associated with each uh, spinal level. There are two kinds of cells in the nervous system. There are the neurons, which are not nearly as abundant as the glial cells are. In fact, the glial cells are five times more abundant. And we're gonna be taking a look uh, at individual glial cell types in this chapter. So we, to this point, just sort of clump them together in a general group. But glial cells do help to maintain homeostasis and are very important for maintaining the health of the neuron. Um, and so we'll take a look at some of their functions. So neurons gather and transmit information by first. Um, they respond to stimulus. We have sensory nerves that pick up information and that information is sent to certain centers and then that information will uh, ultimately uh, <coughs> be integrated and then we'll send out an electrochemical impulse by way usually of the neurotransmitter, again, uh, which is a chemical message to produce some type of response. So the neurons are highly specialized, they have a function, but the glial cells are equally important in helping to maintain those neurons. Everybody has a function when they're born, right? Everybody has a purpose, and a purpose that you are good at. Only you have that ability, it's true. And the glial cells are like that, the neurons as well. So neurons, if you remember, uh, have three parts to them. We have dendrites that bring information into a cell body. And then from the cell body, we transmit signals uh, out through an axon to a terminal end bulb known as a bouton. That's French, bouton. Or you can call it just the end bulb, whichever you prefer. Um, and this is where our neurotransmitters, our chemical signals, will be released from. And neurons have different types of structural, um, stru structural arrangements. Uh, we're going to see some of the structural classifications of neurons. Uh, like, for example, this is a multipolar neuron. This one is pseudo-unipolar. And we'll describe what those are when we get to that slide here. So um, the cell body itself is the nutritional center, and it's also the control center. When information comes into it from the dendrites, the cell body figures out what to do with that information. Should we respond to it? Should we not respond to it? And we'll get into the specifics of that in this chapter. A couple of terms. Uh, in the central nervous system, when you have groups of cell bodies together, we call them a nuclei. So, for example, in the deep brain centers, we have the basal nuclei, which are groups of cell bodies that are found in, <laughs> it's just so funny because it's like you're giving me some hint over here. Yeah. Or after. Yeah. Okay, well, let me just finish my thought, please. So, anyway, um, it, it's found, and it, it helps to produce dopamine, which helps us to move purposefully. Um, and then in the peripheral nervous system, if you have a cluster of cell bodies together, they're called a ganglia. So sometimes people get ganglionic cysts. That's because you've got the group of cell bodies, they've kind of gotten enlarged, and, and that's what it is. That's what the cyst actually is. 
And lastly, the dendrites receive info, convey it to the cell body, and axons conduct the impulses away. And that's it. I'll let you go. As I promised, one minute passed. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, we will pick up with talking about how we move things through the axon uh, when we come back on Tuesday.